We will now move to the next item of business, which is a statement by Hamza Youssef on real services. The Minister will take questions at the end of the statement. There should be no interventions or interruptions. Uh, and in fact, I would ask uh, members if they wish to press their buttons now, those who wish to ask a question later. And I call on the Minister to deliver his statement. Presiding officer, I'm grateful to Parliament for the opportunity to make a statement about our railway network. Let me be quite clear. Everyone rightly expects a railway network that operates effectively. So when things go wrong, I fully understand the dissatisfaction of passengers and the inconvenience that is caused. Before I set out information on the performance of our railways, the actions we are taking and the long-term transformation we have planned, let me say firstly to any passenger who has had a bad experience on our railways that I am sorry and that this government is committed to improving the service you receive. There will always be incidents beyond our control on any transport system that interrupts service. In respect of last Thursday's failure at Edinburgh Waverley, I add my regret to that expressed by the First Minister. The breakdown happened at the worst place on the network, at the worst time, and had a massive effect. Whilst no minister in any government can guarantee that major failures won't happen, I can advise that ScotRail has learned lessons to ensure that they are better prepared for contingencies and, importantly, communication with passengers when such incidents do take place. Indeed, today we've seen a much more responsive reaction by ScotRail to the incident which regrettably affected large number of commuters in the Glasgow area. Let me be clear, this government expects the highest possible standards of our rail industry and to achieve uh, that we have set some of the toughest targets of any franchise in the UK. The franchise agreement asks for 91 out of every 100 trains to arrive at their destination within the recognised industry punctuality measure. Now I have no intention of underplaying issues for passengers or the effect that a slide in service quality can have in the journeys of individuals. But it is important to recognise, presiding officer, that in a number of areas, that target is being met. On the Glasgow Dumbling Line, for example, 93% of services meet that target. For Ayrshire services, that figure is 93.8. On the Paisley Canal, that figure is 97%. Overall performance for the last year is sitting at 89.8, which is better than the figure we inherited in 2007, despite the network being far busier with a 33% increase in passengers. Uh, an additional 130 services running daily. Uh, we set at a higher GB average, at 87%. However, when performance is being measured across the network as a whole, uh, let me be clear, it is not currently where I want it to be. At the same time, I know that increase in passenger numbers and pressure, pressure, pressure on services also means that experience for many passengers is not what they want it to be either. To respond to those concerns, I instructed ScotRail on the 23rd of August to develop a performance improvement plan and to deliver improvements to the customer experience. That plan was published on the 20th of October and the ORR, the independent regulator, has confirmed that it is a robust, challenging, but deliverable plan. There are some 250 individual actions within the plan and work is well underway to deliver them. But passengers want to see action now to strengthen the reliability of the rail infrastructure across the network. So that is why that action I can announce now is, for example, £16 million of investment being brought forward over and above what we have planned to already upgrade key junctions, track and signalling equipment. This week, action is taking place, for example, to new points at Cowlairs to improve circuits in Dunblane, improve the reliability of our Class 334 fleet serving North Lanarkshire, Dumbartonshire and West Lothian. Action is taking place to fit an improved radiator design to tackle the cooling issues experienced by services on the border. They want action. £14 million is being spent on improving the overall reliability of the ScotRail fleet. In respect of operations, revised procedures are put in place at major stations to focus on prompt departures and on managing known pinch points on our network. Uh, commuters tell me that they're tired of skip stopping. A skip stop protocol therefore has been introduced to protect peak time commuters and reduce the instances of stops being missed. I know overcrowding is frustrating for passengers when it happens. I can confirm that we are finalising details to provide more carriages from mid-December on both the morning and the evening peak time service on the Borders Railway. And at the same time, we will also introduce 
an early morning Perth to Inverness commuter service arriving just after 8am. Southbound and new direct, direct service will depart Inverness for Edinburgh arriving before 9.30am and with a change of broadly similar time to Glasgow. These services will provide increased daily travel opportunities between North and Central Scotland. Presiding officer, I know about the work that is required and the service that has to be delivered. I have taken action and a plan is now in place. This government has a track record of delivering for our railways and it is my firm intention that we will continue to do so. We are investing £5 billion up to 2019 to transform the railways with huge increases in carriages, seats and services. Since 2007, 140 extra carriages have been introduced to the ScotRail fleet and an extra 200 carriages will follow in the next 30 months, starting from now. That means 50% more carriages than in 2007. We're investing twice as much per capita as the UK government in the existing network. Our seven cities will be linked by high-speed trains with rolling stock more in keeping with an intercity experiencing, experience providing the latest standard of comfort, accessibility and catering provision, plus 40% more seats. 70 new electric trains will be delivered in the central belt next year, providing commuters with up to 40% of extra seats at peak times on the main Edinburgh to Glasgow route. And we're not forgetting about the existing fleet at all. 90% 90 90 of our current fleet will be totally refurbished to improve the performance and reliability with much better onboard facilities, facilities such as Wi-Fi, power sockets, new lighting and new seats. We're also moving with the times and expanding electronic payments for travel. Already smart cards can be used for season ticket journeys across the railway network. Fare, fare increases are at their lowest level since devolution of rail in 2005. Increases in peak fares are capped at inflation and a five pound intercity fare has been introduced. And all of these initiatives and more are a direct consequence of our passenger focus franchise specification. And to support these service improvements, we are in the midst of one of the most significant transformations of our railway infrastructure in recent memory. I'm only going back, presiding officer, four years, and yet in that period, we've delivered the award-winning Paisley Canal electrification project in 2012, the transformation of Haymarket Station in 2013, the electrification of Glasgow to Cumber Nord Line and the Whiflet Lines in 2014, the opening of the Borders Railway last year, the remodelling of Queen Street Tunnel to prepare for electrification. The, the start of advanced work to improve the Aberdeen to Inverness line, in partnership with local authorities, the redevelopment of Dundee Station for completion during December 2017, ongoing work on the electrification between Edinburgh and Glasgow via Falkirk, commencement of advanced work for the rolling programme of electrification on the Shorts line and to Stirling. In addition, Edinburgh Gateway will shortly open. We've committed funds for Rob Royston, we've committed funds for East Linton and Reston, and we increased the level of central funding for the new Contour station as well. And we're committed to completing these projects, unlike the deferrals and cancellations south of the border, where large cost overruns have triggered an aggressive programme of asset sales, we are not in that position. Our investment in infrastructure signals our confidence in Scotland's railways, but it also means there's a substantial challenge to operate an effective service and introduce new chain, tr trains and enhance the passenger experience while making these major infrastructural improvements. Recognising that challenge, we encourage ScotRail and Network Rail to form an alliance to cement their operational relationship. We have seen some benefits to that approach, particularly through the effective communication and management of improvements works at Winchborough and at the Queen Street Tunnel. But clearly this alliance could do more. Network Rail is a body whose activities in Scotland are fully funded by the Scottish Government, yet its formal accountability we know remains to the UK Government. To fully realise the potential of the alliance, to enable it to deliver the modern railway that passengers expect to see we need that full and further devolution of rail powers and responsibilities. I call on all parties in this chamber to support that objective. <laughs> Presiding officer, we signed a 10-year contract for the provision of passenger rail services with Abellio, and we set tough targets on behalf of Scotland's passengers. It is the duty and responsibility of Abellio to fulfil their obligation under that contract. It is my job to hold them to account, and I will personally be closely monitoring Abellio and their progress in the improvement plan until performance returns to acceptable contractual standards. At the same time, we will also act on the additional powers given to the Parliament in the Scotland Act 2016. This removes the prohibition 
on public sector bodies to bid for future ScotRail franchises. But it does not remove the need for competition. Any public sector bid, of course, would need to be tested in competition so we can pick the best option for Scotland's passengers in an objective manner. So we will use the powers we do have and follow through on our manifesto commitment to take steps for a level playing field and franchise commitments. To take this forward, I've written to trade unions, to party transport spokespersons, to regional transport partnerships and transport focus to invite all parties to the initial roundtable meeting next week, where I will set out our approach, the legal powers and the potential options for a public sector operator. Presiding officer, these have been testing times for passengers particularly, but there is a performance improvement plan in place with concrete actions that I've detailed here and now. Abelio and the government are committed to ensuring the success of the ScotRail franchise. And as I've briefly highlighted, there is a broader backdrop with exciting service propositions, more and new rolling stock, significant infrastructure improvements that will benefit our growing number of rail passengers. I'm acutely aware that, of course, we're about to enter a winter period with all the attendant challenges that that brings. There will be times when winter weather means passengers will face disruption. However, I wish to conclude by stressing that I'm personally determined to achieve the best outcome for passengers. And in that respect, I hope the Chamber will join with me in supporting the efforts and actions of the management and staff of ScotRail in delivering their improvement plan and making a resounding success of our franchise, a franchise which I firmly believe, Presiding Officer, delivers for Scotland. Murder Fraser to be followed by Neil Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. Can I start by thanking the Minister for his statement for an advanced copy of it? If the Minister thought that by making a statement today he would avoid media scrutiny because of the Chancellor's autumn statement earlier, then he has been run down by the express train of events. For this has been another day of delays cancellations and disruption, harming our economy and hurting passengers. And this from a train service which the Minister said yesterday wasn't bad. So we should be clear where responsibility lies, Presiding Officer. It was this SNP Government which awarded the current contract franchise to Abilio. It's this SNP Government which sets the fares and decides how much overcrowding there is on the trains. And it's this SNP Government that has to start taking responsibility for the state of our railways. Now, we've heard a lot of uh, promises from the Minister today, but what passengers want to know is, when will we see improvements? What is the deadline given by the Minister to Abelio for them to meet their current contract obligations? And what exactly are the consequences of them failing to do so? And secondly, Presiding Officer, we will be participating uh, in the Minister's roundtable discussions about how we can improve the rail service. But let us be quite clear why this idea of a public sector bid has been floated. It's in order to try and win over the rail unions who have called for the minister's head. Yeah. Even if it were possible, it would be 2022 before he could take over the Scott Rail franchise. Does the minister not understand that passengers want improvements now, not in six years' time? Yeah. Minister. Let me try to uh, take some of the points that Murdo Fraser uh, has asked about. When he talks about, I heard him yesterday talking about a shambles in Scotland's railway. I completely reject that proposition. But let me just put this in some kind of regional context. We are performing, despite ScotRail not performing to the standards I want them, performing 2% higher than the GB average. Uh, passenger satisfaction is at 7% higher than the GB satisfaction. Yesterday, all I had to do was look at the news where ferries were stranded, roads were closed in England, trains were cancelled across the network. So if he describes this as a shambles, then surely the situation by his government is an omni shambles. So I won't be taking any lectures from him. He said, what actions are the Scottish government? And he's right, passengers and commuters want actions right now. And I detailed some of those actions. They want actions right now. We're accelerating and bringing forward £16 million of spending on our infrastructure. That is on top of the spending we're already bringing forward. They wanted action. Well, I've brought forward £14 million of improvements on the reliability of ScotRail's fleet. They want action when it comes to skip stopping, so a protocol has been put in place for skip stopping at peak times. They want action on capacity, so we've introduced and are going to continue to introduce more carriages uh, on, uh, on our, in our fleet. So when they want action and they demand action, quite rightly, they are getting action from this SNP Scottish Government, which you, I know, won't like. And what I will say about, this may be novel, uh, to, to Murdo Fraser, but when he asked about the public sector bid, this may be novel to him, but it was in our manifesto and we intend to
to take forward and fulfil that pledge uh, of a public sector operator putting forward a public sector bid. I heard him talking about renationalisation. It's worth saying that his government has reclassified national rail, network rail, uh. therefore reclassifying it under the Department for Transport. I'm pleased that he's accepted an invitation to come across. As I've said uh, in my statement, that when it comes to a public sector bid, it has to be competitive with a private sector uh, bid as well. But I do believe that there's some merit in a public sector bid where profits are reinvested back into the railways. And I'll be working with unions, uh, other political parties and transport sp spokespeople uh, for that. So uh, I welcome the fact that he's there. I look forward to what I'm sure will be his constructive ideas. Neil Bibby, followed by Bob Doris. The Scottish Labour are happy to meet the Minister next week to explain to him the benefits of a People's ScotRail. But this statement today was requested in relation to performance here and now. The facts are the Minister demanded an improvement plan and services have become worse. Staff morale is rock at rock bottom. His handling of the situation has seen him fall out with Abellio, Network Rail and Transport Unions. He claimed he wasn't a transport expert and he's right. <laughs> After today, the Minister Will the Minister ditch the spin and publish his 246-point improvement plan in full? So far, passengers in Parliament have only seen a summary document. And the Minister failed to guarantee passengers today when services will get better. Is it still the case that it will be March before targets are hit? This week, the Minister claimed ScotRail wasn't a poor service. Passengers standing on overcrowded platforms waiting for late running overpriced trains would beg to differ. Isn't it the case that he is wrong and passengers are right and he is on the wrong side of Scotland's passengers? Minister. What, 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 I've, what I've heard from Neil Bibby in, in the media this week, and he just repeated it again, are these kind of petty, pathetic personal attacks Absolutely. towards me. And I could, I, I could respond to every single one of them, but I'm not going to. Because passengers watching this, commuters watching this, want to know what action are we taking. So when he says improvement isn't being made, he is, of course, being disingenuous. Because in the last eight weeks, improvement has been made from 89.5% to 89.8%. That is not good enough. That is not where I want it to be. And he shakes his head. But that 89.8%, presiding officer, was higher than every single year when Labour were in government and last in government. So when he says it's not good enough, I agree it's not good enough. It's not good enough. So that's why the improvement plan we want and the franchise that we've committed to will be 91.3%. Uh, I want to see regular improvement. Of course, I've been honest in saying that disruption can happen. I think every reasonable commuter, every passenger I've spoken to understands that winter weather, for example, probably will affect certain services at certain points. But I want the communication to be better. I want the communication to be better to passengers. And I want improvements to be made. Uh, he said action is what is demanded. I agree with him. Action is what is demanded. That is why I've highlighted £16 million of investment on the infrastructure, £14 million on the fleet, skip stopping protocols in place. I've also mentioned the fact that fares increases are at their lowest in anywhere on these islands. And in fact, the lowest in terms of fare increases since we had these powers in 2005. So, well, he wants to cart from the side lines, make pathetic, personal, petty attacks on me. That's fine, I'll leave him to do that. I'll stand up for the commuters and the passengers uh, in this country, day in and day out. Bob Doris to be followed by Morris Golden. Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I welcome potential options for a public sector bid in the future. However, my constituents, particularly those who use the Mary Hill train line, will be more concerned about service improvements over a much shorter time period. I met with Abelia ScotRail to ask them to meet with impacted commuters in my constituency to listen to their concerns with a view to a local improvement plan being put in place, and they have agreed. Can I ask the Minister to take a personal interest in that improvement plan for a train line that has suffered more than most? And does he agree that it is vital Abelio have such local engagement to help drive change? Minister. Yes, I mean, I agree with all of that. I mean, I take a personal interest in performance across all routes. I speak to uh, ScotRail on a daily basis, early in the morning. Uh, and, of course, we Transport Scotland follow up in the evening peak to make sure that uh, services are running to the standards that we expect them. So I take a personal intra interest in that, uh, including the Mary Hill line, to ensure ScotRail delivers its performance improvement plans. I'm pleased that they've had positive engagement. Uh, of course, I'll take that up 
uh, with ScotRail when I speak to them next to make sure that local engagement continues with the member uh, as well. So I'm pleased to hear uh, that he's having a positive experience. And that, me that message goes out to all members across the chamber because they will understandably, when they're representing their constituents, see where improvements can be made. I've spoken to many a member before who's had a constructive relationship with ScotRail. I want that to continue. If there's, any ever, if there's ever any blockages getting to ScotRail, getting to the senior management, then I'm more than happy to take that up with them because I do believe that local engagement is vitally important. Maurice Golden to be followed by James Kelly. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I uh, thank the Minister for the advance copy um, of his statement. Uh, if the Minister is receiving uh, twice uh, daily updates from ScotRail, it's no uh, wonder for his glum demeanour. Uh, but um, a, an effective and efficient rail network is key to meeting our climate change targets. That is why it's deeply concerning that the ScotRail Personal Improvement Plan identifies 250 individual actions. How many of these 250 individual actions have to be delivered for the Minister to be satisfied and what happens if they are not? Minister. Well, again, I'm going to leave aside the, the personal petty attacks that has characterised uh, much of the opposition's uh, attack, which means that they don't have much in the way to go of substance. Uh, passengers and commuters won't thank them for that, uh, I have to say, uh, as well. When it, comes to, when it comes to improvements, I always said to Neil Bibby, the member, is improvements already are being made. 89.5% uh, to 89.8%, not where I want it to be, and we'll be driving that uh, harder uh, where we can. In terms of the actions, yes, we expect all those actions to be completed. I will speak to Scott Rail, as a couple of members uh, have suggested, to see what out of those 246 actions, how many of them can be made fully public, uh, where they, how they can be made public. And I should say, having spoken to Scott Rail, they did say that they would be willing to meet any member here, take them to the control room in Atrium Court, and talk them through any of those provision measures. And let me be clear, uh, if, these, if, if, the, if performance dips, I've been very clear uh, in the public, I've been very clear to members that if performance does not improve, if performance dips, then there are serious consequences to that. But I do have confidence that performance can continue in the right trajectory, notwithstanding disruptions that will happen due to weather events, and we know that that can happen, and due to mechanical faults and technical failures. Those things can happen, but passengers want a better service, I've instructed this improvement plan. There are some number of actions that will come forward from that, and I'm happy to keep the member updated on the progress. James Kelly to be followed by John Finney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's totally unacceptable that too many trains are overcrowded, particularly at peak times. Can the Minister explain why uh, that continues to be the case in a so-called world-leading contract while Abellio continue to rake in millions of pounds in profits while passengers have got to stand during their train journeys? Minister. I think it's a very fair question uh, from, from James Kelly. Uh, when it comes to the carriages, what I've already said, well, let's take the overcrowding uh, issue. There has been a huge increase in passenger growth, 33% since 2007. So since 2007, we've introduced 140 extra carriages. But on top of that, what I've announced today is an additional 200 carriages uh, up to 2019, including starting immediately. So we have seven trains coming on to the Glasgow suburban route, the busiest route, which would affect, uh, I'm sure, uh, Mr. Kelly's uh, constituents. Uh, six of them are on route, one more uh, train to come. Uh, but on top of that, I've also just announced from mid-December additional carriages coming to the border. So I agree with them. Overcrowding is an issue. It is part of the improvement plan. It's part of our investment. And by the time this investment is complete, those 200 additional carriages, the additional 200 services that we're introducing, uh, like as I said, lower fares and lower increases uh, in fares, the additional spending on the infrastructure, all of that will lead, I believe, and has the ability to lead to a much better service for passengers. So he's right, overcrowding is an issue. It's one that's part of the improvement plan and tackling. And I've set out some of actions of, on how we intend to tackle that. John Finney, followed by Mike Rumbles. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, well, I thank the Minister for early sight of the statement and indeed for the invitation to the meeting, which I'll be happy to take up. Also, the good news about the Inverness Perth commuter services. Now, whilst, Minister, it's entirely fair to record that delays will be inevitable in any service, I think it's important that you have recognised the level of dissatisfaction. And when performance is low and it's worse than the far north line, as I think you're aware, it's certainly our view that passengers should automatically receive a form to claim compensation rather than to go looking for one. Would you be able to make sure that that's the case? 
And could you also direct some small capital investment to ensure that the facilities for passengers waiting for connections are warm, secure and safe, please? Minister. I thank uh, the member for the constructive tone in which he asked the question. I think in terms of the compensation side, he, he's absolutely right. It frustrates passengers when they don't get the service uh, that they expect, uh, that there can be uh, additional obstacles and hoops to go through when it comes to compensation. Uh, I've uh, in, in, recently, my officials uh, have started and instructed uh, ScotRail to look at a review of their compensation processes and procedures. I'll make sure, and I'm sure it's already being fed in, in terms of this idea that automatically forms are given uh, if performance uh, doesn't meet the, the, the threshold and the expectations that we have. And I'll keep the member updated on that. On, on his uh, wider point uh, around uh, facilities and the, the, the below standards uh, that, that, that we see in some stations uh, in terms of investment, uh, he will know about our SQUI regime, which is the toughest auditing regime on these islands by far. Uh, and that has uh, recently, for example, ScotRail have had to pay almost uh, just under half a million pounds because they've failed to meet the expectations. Again, when it comes to passenger facilities at stations and so on and so forth. Uh, that fund now topping over two million pounds gets reinvested back in to ensure that these standards are met. So I'll ensure that my officials write to him about some of the actions that ScotRail have taken. If he has specific stations he thinks that need upgraded, uh, where the facilities need upgraded, of course, uh, those can be directly passed on to ScotRail uh, and I will be happy to take a, a, a look at that. In terms of his support, for uh, our commitment in terms of a public sector operator uh, putting forward a public sector bid. I look forward to discussing that with him uh, next week and hearing the Greens' ideas uh, on that. Mike Rumbles to be followed by John Mason. When will the Minister stop causing confusion? At the weekend, he said the service was so poor he was setting up a public sector operator. Just now, he said it wasn't poor after all. Passengers, I'm afraid, don't want ministerial final. They want to see the plan of action and the timetable for improvements enforced. He has just said in his statement that he published the plan with its 250 actions. He has done no such thing. More confusion from a confused minister. Where is the evidence that the minister has any intention of publishing the full list of 250 actions with their time limits? Minister. Uh, it's not what I said. Uh, what I said was that a version of the improvement plan was published on the 20th of October. Uh, he has asked me, and a number of other members have asked me, can those 250, around 250 actions uh, be published? I'll speak to Scott Rail about that, and I'll get back to the member on that. I think as much accountability, as much transparency around those actions it should be made as, as possible. There are sometimes uh, some issues and some reasons why that can't be the case, and I'll be fully transparent and fully open with the member uh, and indeed with the passengers and with commuters about why that's the case. When it comes to level of service, I have been clear that it is simply not good enough. Otherwise, if I thought it was good enough, I wouldn't have instructed an improvement plan. I have instructed an improvement plan uh, because I believe it's not good enough. Improvements are being made. If we look over that eight-week period, um, of course, the railway year demands that that, uh, that improvement is above 90.3%, which is a trigger above the improvement plan. 91.3%, of course, is what is in the contract. That is a very high target and one that we expect uh, the operator to deliver. John Mason to be followed by Annie Wells. Hey, thank you. Uh, Minister, I understand this morning that there were delays on the Glasgow Central low level to Partick line because of damage to the overhead wires. A, can the Minister say if he is satisfied with the way that ScotRail dealt with that? Minister. I mean, when it comes to the, the, the overhanging uh, line equipment, when it comes to the network rails infrastructure, this is the reason why we're bringing forward £60 million of investment on that infrastructure. I think commuters, they hear about points failures and signal failures and failures with the overheading, uh, overhanging uh, over, overhead line equipment uh, quite frequently, and that's why we're bringing forward uh, that investment. When I said in my statement that lessons have been learned, I mean, last Thursday's disruption caused huge amounts uh, of, of disruption for passengers and commuters. Uh, but one of the most frustrating parts of that for, for commuters that I heard from passengers was the lack of information coming forward. They felt they weren't being told by frontline staff, uh, who frontline staff themselves feel they were getting the information communicated to them uh, from the centre as well. So lessons have been learned. Let me just give him uh, some examples of that. So he's right, early, early, uh, early hours of this morning, a rail hair treatment train operating uh, for the autumn period came into contact with an object that was hanging from the overhead 
uh, line equipment uh, in, in the vicinity in the Kelvinhof tunnel area uh, near Finiston. Uh, that caused damage to that overhead uh, line uh, equipment. Uh, what was done by ScotRail uh, after that, the first text messages were sent to passengers at 5.59 in the morning. That alert was then repeated every 30 minutes uh, and then at 7.45 it was repeated every 15 minutes. They initially updated the website ScotRail at 11 minutes past six in the morning. Station announcements were initiated at the beginning of service and repeated every 10 minutes. 20 additional staff were deployed to stations across the network to affected stations. Senior managers were also sent down to the exhibition centre uh, station, the Anderston station, to make sure that they could deal with uh, inquiries there. So I'm not saying it was perfect. Disruption, of course, of any nature causes, uh, causes difficulties for commuters and passengers. And I again repeat my apology for any disruption that has caused. I don't want, as the Transport Minister, to see that disruption, but sometimes uh, these things can happen. And I don't think anybody is seriously suggesting that services should have run. That would have put passengers' lives at risk. Um, running trains through uh, where uh, wires were hanging from an overhead line. So I do think lessons have been learned. I think things can, of course, get better, should get better. And that's why I'll continue to hold Abelio to account for that. Annie Wells, to be followed by June McAlpine. Thank you, Presiding Officer. If the Minister is accepting he is struggling in his job to hold Abelio to account, what makes him think he would be any better running the trains himself? If he's failing as the ticket examiner, why would you be any better as the driver? Minister. Again, it's these uh, pathetic, petty, personal attacks with no substance in them uh, whatsoever at all. Um, but uh, I must... I must say, presiding officer, uh, you know, it was well read uh, off the script, but the personal, what I would say about the public sector bid is she has said that her transport spokesperson will come. I'm very happy to listen to their ideas. What she shouldn't do is be dismissive of open competition. Uh, there's a private company that will compete. Why on earth could a public sector company not do that? We already have that with CalMac. CalMac competed with a private operator is running a good service. You might not like that, and you can shake your head like uh, that. at that, but why can a public sector company, why could an operator run by a public sector, why could it not compete with a private company? It can. Now, our manifesto commitment is to bring forward as many people as part of that big bothy, part of the big tent, to come together to help us to inform that discussion. I'm delighted she'll attend, and I uh, look forward to hearing her constructive, I hope, ideas on this. Joe McAlpine to be followed by Elaine Smith. Uh, thank you, Pres Presiding Officer. A rail accident investigations branch report this month into the closure of the Lamington viaduct between Carstairs and Lockerbie in my region revealed a series of faults by Network Rail which could have led to serious loss of life had it not been for the actions of a vigilant train driver. The report said corrosion was identified in 2005 but nothing was done and the Chief Inspectors expressed a serious concern. What power, if any, does the Scottish Government have to hold Network Rail to account for this appalling neglect? And how can we be sure that Network Rail has not been similarly negligent in its maintenance of other stretches of track in Scotland? Thank you. Minister. Uh, clearly, the, the, the safety of passenger staff and the wider public is the number one priority for all parties involved in Scotland's railway. And, and I don't think that would differ from any of the political parties uh, around uh, the chamber. Uh, the RAIB, the Rail Accidents uh, Investigation uh, Branch report, raised a number of serious uh, questions and concerns around the circumstances that led to the closure, uh, as she mentions, of Lamington Viaduct last winter. The Scottish Government uh, has a number of devolved responsibilities, but railway safety, as she may know, is a reserve matter. The independent health and safety regulator, the uh, ORR, is undertaking its own review of the incident and will look to them uh, to determine whether there has been any breach of, of health and safety obligations by Network Rail and if any and whether any uh, enforcement action is required. I have a constructive relationship with the Railway Minister and the UK Government Department for Transport, Paul Maynard, uh, and of course any lessons learned, I'll be happy to share those uh, and hear from him how they might uh, also take forward some of the, 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 uh, the, the findings uh, of that uh, review. However, let me be clear, the Scottish Government uh, has funded Network Rail to fully discharge all of its safety obligations as determined independently by the ORR. Uh, the issues identified by the RAIB can in no way be equated to a lack of funding uh, at all from the Scottish Government. Elaine Smith. President officer, the Minister mentioned the signing of the 10-year contract with Abellio in his statement and now pursuing a public sector bid. Can I confirm, as outlined in my motion of October 2014 and confirmed by the RMT, that the Government could have delayed the contract award until the new powers were devolved and a public sector bid permitted? And he also mentioned WIFLET 
where 53 per cent of trains arrive late. So can you now tell us exactly how much longer people will have to put up with late overpriced, overcrowded cancelled trains before the government steps in to establish a public operator of last resort? Yes, I, mean, I, would, I would make the point to the member that uh, you know, attacking uh, Bellio, and I, can, I agree with her that the performance hasn't been up to scratch, but Labour, of course, when they were in the UK government, also appointed a Bellio to a franchise uh, as well. And when it comes to the public sector bid, can I just remind the member that it was this government that brought in the legislation to allow a public sector operator to bring forward a public sector bid after an action of uh, her government for a, a number of years. In fact, I saw a question from Kenny McCaskill to Lewis MacDonald on this very question in 2002, in which uh, he said uh, those discussions uh, with the UK government he was having, but clearly didn't materialise in those powers coming to the Scottish Parliament. So it should be recognised that this party brought forward the powers to allow a public sector operator to bring forward a public sector bid. Uh, clearly there's a lot of work that has to go into that. Uh, that's why I'm calling for political party, transport spokespersons, RTPs, unions to come around the table to help us to inform uh, that discussion. I'll look forward to her constructive uh, ideas uh, very much on that. But we are committed to a public sector bid and we are the party that brought the legislation forward to allow that to happen. Can I thank members? Uh, that brings to... Yeah, point of order, Mike Rumbles. Presiding officer, I seek your guidance. Um, the minister in his statement, and I read out his statement, I have got a copy of it here. He said, and I quote, I instructed ScotRail on the 23rd of August to develop a performance improvement plan. That plan was published on the 20th of October. There are some 250 individual action plans, within, action points within the plan. I have been unable to locate the publication of these 250 uh, action plans. They haven't been published in the public domain. SPICE, more importantly, if members would like to listen to this, they may find this information helpful. SPICE does not have that information. And I seek your guidance, presiding officer, whether SPICE, this certainly is a point of order, whether, whether SPICE would have that information available. Thank the member for the point of order. It was the same as the question he asked the minister. The minister replied. Uh, the, minister, the member is at liberty to uh, ask further questions of the minister or to write to the minister or to make inquiries of SPICE seeking the information he seeks. But it's not a point of order for me to rule on this now. Uh, that's, sorry, a further point of order from Elaine Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wondered if you could um, advise whether it's, uh, there's anything in the standing orders about replying to questions. I had laid questions for the government at the beginning of the month. Some of those questions were addressed in the statement. Today is the last day for the replies and they have not yet been replied to before I came into the chamber. Can you give guidance on when members of this parliament should expect replies to the questions that they put? Uh, thank the member for their question. Uh, there are timescales laid down uh, which offer guidance to members which the member should be aware of and I would expect uh, the government to respond within those timescales. The, the member is free to ask questions of the minister if the, the timescales have not been adhered to. Now we've gone well over time and we've eaten into a debate which I know is of great interest to members. Shall we take a few minutes just to change seats uh, and then we'll uh, move on with the future of Social Security in Scotland and Jean Freeman to open.